then I tried being super strong, I tried being perfect in the South Africa, you know, nothing's gonna get me down. But to be honest, when I got home after all my events, I would lock myself inside my, inside my house, inside the, the door in the middle of my hallway, inside my room. If I went to the bathroom, I locked myself inside of the bathroom and I put the alarm system on while I was inside the house. I totally became paranoid. Um, I started living in fear for probably a month. Um, I was too afraid to drive myself. And that's when I realized that if I keep continuing to live in fear and trying to handle this myself, it's not going to get me anywhere. And you know what? To ask for help or to talk about it does not mean you are weak. It does not mean that you are weak to ask for help. And that's what I did. I got professional help. I went to a therapist and I did a few sessions with her until I felt better, until she felt that I was better, until I could get back in my car and start driving again. And I just realized that if I allow these five things to keep me captured in fear, they win. And I'm not going to let them win. Um, and that's why I want you to go and share your story with just two people. Just three. Who knows three people? <laughs> right? Just three. You never know what somebody might be going through. You never know who might just need that inspiration or that comfort level of being able to share their story with you, with a professional, with a family member. Because I truly believe if we can start talking about about whatever our problems are, whatever our situations are, we can actually start doing something about it. And if you do not feel that you have somebody in your immediate circle around you that you can trust, that you can talk to, there's people that are trained, that are super skilled, that want to help you, that can help you, that helped me. Although I had a great support system, friends and family, I know that that's not always the case for everyone. And ladies, all of you sitting here today, you know what you guys are? You're not just happy girls. You're not just girls that have a dream of becoming Miss Teen or Miss USA. You're a sisterhood. You're a sisterhood. You're all ladies that have like-minded goals and like-minded ambitions. Can you imagine if you guys are so powerful and so strong as individual females? Can you imagine how strong you would be if you support each other and if you take hands and build each other up and be there for each other? Can you imagine? Gosh, that's a point I would want to deal with. <laughs> um, so once again, I want to remind you that this podcast is for two people. And lastly, one thing that I, just a little bit of trivia, blindfold and unbreakable, in, in that month that I was so fearful and just living in like kind of isolation and by myself and just didn't want to drive or go anywhere or do anything, got aside from food falling on the ground. I was emotionally bruised. I was completely shattered. I lived in fear. But I realized that I can be unbreakable because I had a choice. And I chose not to live in fear. Um, I would love to pull up more to go um, to share with you the things that he shared with me prior to this incident. Um, Mark is the founder of Women Empowered in South Africa. And I think the work that he does is just absolutely incredible. Um, Mark, maybe you can tell them more about your, your previous experiences. Um, and yeah, I'll take over to you. Mark Trotter, everyone. Some of you are a little bit shaken, but I think it needs to be said. 24 years.
years ago, a young lady was taking washing out of the passenger seat of her car um, in a little, a little town called New Port Elizabeth in South Africa. It was one o'clock in the morning. She'd just come back from her mother. And she said, uh, let's put the door open, the door of the car open, and the guy put a knife on her throat and said, get in the car, kid. So she climbed across into the passenger seat. She helped him start the car. But she said her ignition was a little bit funny, so there's no way they could have started the car by himself. So he, she helped him start the car. They then drove to town where they picked up a friend of his. They then drove to the beach, a secluded part of the beach that was nearby, where they both raped her. The one guy then just jumped on top of her and throttled her. She looked up at him and said, please don't. And he looked her in the eye and just said, I'm sorry. And he throttled her, he squeezed her windpipe shut. And she passed out when they, when she, obviously when they cut off her, cut off her air supply. She woke up when they slit her throat 16 times. They stabbed her about 50 times here in the lower abdomen and they left her to die. And she laid out in the sand and she said she wrote in the sand, I love you, mum. And she said she put like a little box around her because she was a bit of a neatness freak. And then she laid down in the sand to die. And then she realized, you know what, I don't really want to die today. So she got up, she picked her entrails out of the sand because they'd stabbed her so many times here that the muscle wall had, had basically parted and her intestines were out. So she had her intestines in her hand and she was crawling on her hands and knees. I was actually at a function with her the other day. So she's alive and well. But she was, she was telling me, you know how difficult it is, Mark, to crawl on your hands and knees with one hand with your intestines and she has like a bit of a laugh about it. It's quite difficult, like you overbalance and you fall. But anyway, she said she was crawling along with her intestines in her hand and, and she realized she wouldn't get to the road, which was about 300 meters. I don't know how many yards that is, but it's quite a way. She realized she wouldn't get there that if she, if she just crawled, that she'd have to stand up. And when she stood up to walk, her head fell down between her shoulder blades. It's because they'd cut through these muscles here on the side of her neck and she had no control over her head. So while she was when she stood up, she said, I could just see the stars. So she literally had to pull her head forward with her entrails in her hands. And she made it to the road. And she's alive and she's well and she's my friend. Her name is Allison. If you guys are, uh, if you guys are interested on the interweb or FaceTube or whatever, what do, we, what do you guys call it? FaceTube. If you go and search Allison, A-L-I-S-O, Allison, the movie. You'll feel there's lots of stuff there. She's, got, she's written a book called I Have Life, which is, I advise every young woman to, to, to have a read. But the reason why I'm telling you the story is I met Alison in London about 25 years ago. I can see some of you thinking, what was a four-year-old doing in London 25 years ago? <laughs> I can see some of you doing the sums there. I was seven at the time, so. A bit more than so anyway we became really good friends she was, she was uh, dating a friend of mine in London we became good friends um, I came I came back home came back to South Africa and I lost contact with her I just knew her name was Alison and she lived in, in Port Elizabeth and I was sitting in the doctor's rooms one day and I pulled out a magazine a new magazine it's like a local magazine in South Africa